Well, Escape was an anthology show, and the truly brilliant thinking of show business at the time, since suspense was such a success, why not another show of the same kind? So Escape was pretty darn close to suspense, and very often we used the same material. Escape, CBS's high adventure anthology, debuted on July 7th, 1947. During its erratic seven-year run, it was shifted and dropped frequently, almost always cost sustained by the network. The assistant director, who was Norman MacDonald for most of the Escape series, when I was doing it, and who subsequently succeeded me as director on it for a while, the assistant director's function was to time the rehearsals, to time the show, and while on the air, advise the director how he was running fast or slow, etc., and generally to take care of the mechanical end of the production. It developed into an experimental training ground in the late 1940s for those who'd come to dominate radio in the next decade. I used the finest actors in Hollywood. Jack Webb, who went on to become Sergeant Friday in Dragnet. Jeff Corey used to do a lot of things. Ben Wright. An Englishman born in Brooklyn who had a magnificent English accent, did many wonderful performances. Sam Edwards, a wonderful Texas accent, and an authentic one. Jeff Chandler, the late Jeff Chandler, was one of our regulars. John Daner, who was still very active in television. Then there was Parley Bear, who did much of the support work. Howard McNair was one of our absolutely invaluable support people. Georgia Ellis, of course, was one of our regulars, and Georgia became Kitty. And, of course, the man who came on and in deep tones said, want to get away from it all, want to escape, that man was Bill Conrad. I was doing a lot of work around CBS, and my God, in those days, it was unbelievable. We were doing 15, averaging maybe 10 to 15 shows a week. A lot of it was at CBS. I never got involved in the comedy shows, so I did all of the dramatic shows. I started doing the opening voice in it. Frankly, I don't remember how it started, but I did an awful lot of it. The show was originally produced and directed by William N. Robeson, as Mary Jane Croft, Jeanette Nolan, and Sam Edwards remembered. Dan and I were just talking about, on the, a little while ago, about Bill Robeson who was a rather difficult man. Yes. <laughs> Egocentric to a fault. Always wore capes. Didn't he wear capes? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but he could have been the Phantom of the Opera. I yes, guess. that kind of thing. I think it had red silk lining or something. But, uh, and he wasn't really difficult, but he was, he made himself known. Yes, he was a very commanding president. Commanding indeed. And he well, he wanted to rewrite every script. I mean, you, you, yes. the, the original script had no resemblance to the mm -hmm. final product. Right. right, and he did calling all... By the end of 1947, oh, yeah. CBS had put together 36 new radio programs. But few were sponsored. It also established a news documentary unit. Television was now a programming factor. That year, William Paley negotiated a $20 million loan from the Equitable Assurance Society so that CBS would have the resources to move into TV. The 1947-48 season was the last year of major growth for the network radio industry. Revenues broke the $200 million mark for the first time. Thanks to a surging baby boom, top 50 average ratings jumped 23%. It was the most popular radio season ever Young parents were staying home to take care of their children. Movie attendance bombed. The networks were also beginning to control programming, previously vested with the advertiser and its agency. William Paley knew that by doing so, CBS could dictate terms to its potential advertisers. They were spending millions on network-sustained programs without any assurance of finding a sponsor to absorb these costs. Escape was one of these gambles. Tired of the everyday grind? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We, we offer, offer you... you... Escape! Escape, designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. 
Escape, brought to you by your Richfield gasoline dealer and the Richfield Oil Corporation of New York. Marketers of Richfield gasolines, motor oils, and other petroleum products. Look for the Richfield Eagle on the cream and blue pumps. Tonight, we escape to the prairie west of the Platte River and to the Indian fighting U.S. cavalry of the Old West. As James Warner Bella describes it in his exciting tale, Command. Robeson's assistant was Norman MacDonald. By late 1949, they were alternating directorial duties, experimenting with first-person present tense narratives and adult-oriented westerns. Comes Lieutenant Cohill back with the patrol. Yes, I see him. Halt the column. Yes, sir. Column! 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 Hand me my field glasses, Sergeant. Yes, sir. There you are, sir. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Mm. Captain Brittles. Well, Mr. Cohill. Here's the best body of grass, sir. This slope with the small run below for water. This is the best bivouac for tonight. Mr. Cohill, do you see the rise there to the left behind you across the valley? Yes, sir. What are those shapes lying on that slope? A small herd of buffalo, sleeping it seems. We didn't go that far, sir. We turned back when we saw them. The wind has shifted a bit. Take a deep breath, Mr. Cohill. Yes, sir. Smell anything? No, sir. Take another deep breath, Mr. Cohill. Get it in your nostrils and tell me if what you smell is sleeping buffalo. No, sir. It smells like dead men. And not freshly killed. Lieutenant Gresham and his squad, sir? I imagine so. The men we've come to find. We'll make sure after nightfall. Mr. Cohill, there are several fairly obvious differences between the Great Plains and a classroom at West Point. There you can fail and try again. Here you may not have that chance. There they taught you, I am sure, that accuracy and observation is a military virtue. I suggest that you cultivate it here. Sergeant Utterback. Yes, sir. This is the bivouac. This mountain on saddle. Night grazing area between the crest of this hill and the creek bottom. Use the picket rope, no individual pins. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. Yes, sir, Captain Brettles. No, sir, Captain Brettles. Of all the officers in the United States Cavalry, why did they have to assign me to him? A handbook soldier, over age and grade. A bitter failure of a soldier marking time out here on the plains until he retires, taking up space in the table of organization, standing in the way of younger and more aggressive and, yes, more capable officers. My father wouldn't be guessing. Father would be over yonder right now to see if those corpses are really Gresham and his men. Father would have made sure instead of losing time making camp. The broken rattle Sergeant Utterback had found at noon showed clearly, sir, that broken rattle the sergeant found. Yes, Mr. Cohill. What we crossed the trace of that Sioux war party at noon today. That could have been the trail of a Cheyenne war party or Comanches or Apaches. They all make rattles like that from the ends of buffalo toes. But if they were, Sue, they couldn't be more than 30 miles to the north in the Deadlands. They're afraid of ambush, so they'd be camping away from timber and near water. Two hours rest and we can be at the upper reaches of the river by dawn, sir, ahead of them. Mr. Cowell, I have no orders to be anywhere by dawn or any other time. My orders are to find Mr. Gresham's patrol and, having found it, return to Fort Stark and report it. I think I've found him. I'll know as soon as the moon rises and I go over and take a look. Water the mounts in half an hour. Yes, sir. Mr. Cohill! Sir? Reading minds is an uncomfortable habit, but one I have never been able to lose. Yes, sir. Look at the other side of it. Suppose that war party was Cheyenne, which they might be instead of Sioux. They wouldn't be in the Deadlands. Cheyennes would head for timber along the lower Mesa Roja. So would Arapahoes, Kiowas, or Comanches. They'd all bivouac in the open timber. And, Mr. Cohill, they all make rattles out of buffalo toes. Yes, sir. Pass the word to Sergeant Utterback that dinner will be at 6.30, but the bugler will not sound calls. Yes, sir. And Mr. Cohill. Yes, sir. 
There is no shortcut to the top of the glory heap. So we'll not run all over the West tonight looking for one. On December 6th, 1949, audiences heard Command, a story about the lessons a young West Point cavalryman must learn on the frontier, starring Elliot Reed and Bill Johnstone. Yet what we looked upon that night on yonder slope was not glorious. It was popular enough to be repeated in May, starring Harry Bartell and John Hoyt. How's that, Sergeant? Every one of them skin bald The next month, on January 3rd, 1950, Gerald Moore and Betty Lou Gerson starred in The Pistol. Jerry was a rather flamboyant. Do you remember the thing that he'd made in Sweden? Foreign Intrigue. Foreign Intrigue. Yeah, Foreign Intrigue. That was uh, later. Jerry played Foreign Intrigue before Foreign Intrigue. <laughs> he wore a raincoat or a top coat on the outside. He never put his hands in it. <laughs> was it and like a cape? Seriously, he wore it as a cape. And he was very swashbuckly debonair. And he took that cape off and he sat down. He had a very beautiful voice. He yeah, was he's a, a very good actor, good radio actor, better radio actor, I thought, than he was. A real good actor. But he was, he was a joy because of his flamboyant attitude. And, well, how's everything going? <laughs> he is a... Uh, but he was marvelous. And a ladies' man, holy cow. <laughs> the ladies went bananas. They really did. San Francisco Bay was a graveyard that summer. With over 300 deserted windjammers lying at anchor, and the city itself the next step to a ghost town. Every man who could walk, run, or stagger had headed inland to look for gold. And the women had followed. Mostly they traveled up the river as far as Sacramento then fanned out into the hills. That was the jumping off place, Sacramento. Boys, move up close. Everybody sees and everybody gets a chance. Anytime old Honest Faraday runs an auction, you know it's on the level. All right now, friends. The pistol I'm holding in my hand here is the first one of its kind ever seen west of the Rockies. The first model of Dr. Samuel Coates' new 44 caliber six-shooter. The gun that fires six times without reloading. Now, who'll open her up with a bit of $250? Did you hear me? $250. Come on, boys. There's plenty of gold on the Sacramento River but only one Colt six shooter. Now, did I hear a bit of say? $250! Thank you, sir. The man says $250. All right, here we I go. I stood there in the hot sun on the Sacramento waterfront and watched the crowd bidding for the pistol. Roustabouts, gamblers, vaqueros, gold miners, men from everywhere and from nowhere. And a few women. I wanted that gun myself. I wanted it bad. I was taking a stagecoach to Rawhide Flats in the morning where my brother Dave and his partner had located a rich claim. And I didn't plan to load myself down with an outfit, but a gun was different. I was packing $1,000 in gold eagles, and I was ready to lay out a good part of it to get that six-shooter. The bidding reached $500. Anybody else? Anybody make it five fifty? Five and a quarter. Five and a quarter. Anybody else? All right. Going once. Going twice. Six hundred dollars. Six hundred dollars. And the new bidder. I have six hundred dollars. Gentlemen here bid six hundred. Will anybody make it six and a quarter? Six and a quarter. Only six. Seven hundred dollars. And another new bidder. And the little lady knows a bargain when she sees one. All right. I'm bid seven hundred. Seven, seven, seven. Will anybody make it eight? How about you, Mister? Follow the bid six. Would you want to raise it again, sir? Sorry, Mister. Six was my limit. Let her have. All right, anybody else? Going once, going twice, so Lady, you bought yourself a gun. Thank now, you. friends, if you'll step Pardon right me, over please. here to the end of the platform, I've got Could I get through? Pardon me, please. Well, right. congratulations. What? Oh, you should have kept on bidding. Why? You'd have gone to $1,000 if you had to. Yes, I suppose I would. I guess it just isn't your lucky day. Oh, I don't know. Haven't I just met the prettiest girl in California? Have you? Haven't I? Maybe that's not as lucky as you think. When I climbed on board the stagecoach to Rawhide Flats the next morning, I found seven trunks had already been loaded, five tied on the back and top and two inside. And a few minutes later, their owner showed up. Oh, it was the red-headed gal who'd bought the gun the afternoon before. It took five miles out of Sacramento to break the ice. And after that, well, I learned her name was Teresa Blake. She'd been down to San Francisco to buy some new clothes. 
And she was on her way back to Rawhide Flats. No. No, I don't live with my folks. I don't have any folks. I I work. Oh? Doing what? I'm a singer. The Brass Nugget Saloon. I see. No wonder you wanted a gun so bad. No, I never have any trouble there. I got the pistol as a present for my boss, Mr. Mallory. $700 makes a pretty expensive present, Miss Blake. He's been good to me. Awfully good. I see. Well, anyway, it's a great gun. In 15 years, every man west of St. Louis will be packing one. Oh, I was going to give you something. I almost forgot. A sort of consolation prize for losing out on the gun. Oh, here it is. It looks like a little gold nugget. Brass, not gold. It's a hang on a watch chain. Souvenir of the Brass Nugget Saloon. Of course, you can pretend it's real gold if you like. All right, I will then. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that's not what my young brother's doing on the Boston Pocket Claim of his. I mean, pretending it's real. The Boston Pocket Claim? Uh-huh. You said your name was Storm. That's right. Jonathan Storm. I didn't even recognize it until... Then you're Dave Storm's brother. Yeah. Do you know him? Yes. Yes, I... Mr. Storm, I wonder if you'd mind if I tried to get some sleep now. I'm... I'm really awfully tired. Around the middle of the afternoon, our stagecoach dropped out of the rough hills we've been traveling through. Ran down into a comparatively level gulf, splashed across the ford in the creek below town, and swung into the wagon-rutted main street of Rawhide Flats. It was like every other boom town I'd seen. A mixture of mud, shacks, board-fronted stores, bars, room and houses, stables, horses, burrows, and men. Men everywhere, milling and shoving along the plank walks and out into the street. Noisy, brawling, bearded, and tough. Rawhide flats. Half hour later, I rented a horse and rode up through the canyon north of town. Both banks of the creek were lined with miners busy with picks and shovels, pans and rockers. All of them breaking their backs. Sweating out their hearts for the same reason. Gold. About three miles up, I turned into the side canyon the man at the livery stable had told me about. And a few yards in, I found it blocked off by a six-foot rail fence. All right, mister. That's far enough. Yeah? Afraid I might jump that fence? Don't get smart. Just turn that horse around and head out the same way you came in. Why? I just got here. Is this the Boston Pocket Claim? That's right. You're as close to it right now as you're going to be. Go on, get me. Now, look, suppose you put that rifle away before it goes off and hurts somebody, huh? And go tell the owner his brother's here. Barton Mallory's got no brother. Now, get out. Mallory? The way I heard it, Dave Storm is the owner of this claim. Storm? Are you Storm's brother? That's right. Is he around here? Get out of here, Storm. Boot that horse and ride, do you hear me? He's the last one you're going to get. So start riding. All right, mister. I never argue with anybody who's packing a rifle. Unless I've got one, too. And maybe the next time I will have. Come on, boy, get up! The thing we did, which I thought was so... Marvelous. The good radio actors mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. were actors. They used their script as a reference. They were not like people who do takeoffs on mm -hmm. them, you know, where they're mm -hmm. glued to a script or something. Yeah. You had rehearsed it twice. If you were an actor, you practically winged your script. You know this. Mm -hmm. And uh, you used the uh, script only kind of as a reference. So that the transition to television I found very, very easy because I had almost a photographic memory. My husband has a completely photographic memory. It was under this watch that the Richfield Oil Company sponsored Escape between April and August of 1950, the only time the show found a regular advertiser. <laughs> Tonight, we escape to the Old West in the story of a boy who never owned anything but a gun. As Joel Mercutt tells it in his exciting tale, Sundown.
The sun is kissing the top of the mountains, and in a minute the shadows will start to sneak along the street. It's sundown, and you can't do nothing to stop it. Everybody knows that. That's why the town looks like a ghost town. Not a horse nor a rider in sight, not even a tumbleweed. Oh, there's folks around, all right, looking out from door cracks and windows. And now the street ain't empty no more. Here's what they've been waiting for. There's Kirby Hunsaker coming out of the saloon at one end of the town, and there's Ben Ford coming from the liver stable at the other end. Both of them walking towards each other slow, right hands hanging like claws an inch from the gun holsters. In a minute, one of them will be dead. Kirby Hunsaker or Ben Ford? Little Ben. Nothing but a baby when I picked him up off of the desert 15 years ago. Hold up a minute, Sam. What is it? Over there, a dried out hole, see you? Yeah, looks like a man. Let's have a look. Yeah, it's a man right enough, or what's left of him. Oh. He's come a long way for water, comes the wrong place. Give me a hand with him. He alive? I don't know. Well, yeah, he's alive, can't he? Yeah, friend, swig this. You better hold it to him. Huh? Son's got his eyes, he's blind. Oh. Drink it. Drink just a little bit of it. Oh, it ain't gonna help him much. Burn clean through. Yeah. That better? Thanks. My wife and my kid. Yeah, yeah, we're there. Back, back there. Where I left the wagon. Animals died. I, I... Came for water. Better give me some more, Dan. No, he don't need it no more. All we can do is find his wife and kid, if there's anything left to find. There was something left. A sun-baked wagon in the midst of that hellish inferno, a dead woman and a kid, five-year-old boy. His face is burned, his lips is cracked with fever, but his eyes stared out across that desert like they was following some nightmare that nobody else could see. He didn't cry, he didn't whimper, he didn't talk. We gave him water and he took it. There wasn't no place to send him, and he just stood there watching us as, as we buried his mother. Well, what do we do about him? A kid? Take him with us, I reckon. Ain't much else we can do. Well, ain't nobody on the ranch to take care of him. No, ain't nobody here neither. He's like a little cactus, Sam. He'll grow or he'll die. On June 23rd, Escape broadcast Sundown, starring Sam Edwards, Barton Yarborough, and Will Greer. It's the story of an orphan boy named Ben taken in by two men. They gift the boy a horse, which he cherishes, until one day a gunslinger named Kirby Hunsicker rides into town. While Ben is doing chores, Hunsicker forces a trade of his old horse for the boys. Hunsicker runs the horse into the ground, and Ben the boy is forced to euthanize the animal. Barton Yarborough's character, Dan, offers Ben any other gift he'd like. Ben chooses a gun. He spends the rest of his childhood learning to be a gunfighter, eventually getting the chance for revenge. Their eyes caught and held like two longhorns locked together. I hear somebody's looking for me. In case anybody don't know me, name's Kirby Hunsaker. I'm looking for you. Speak your piece. A long time ago, when I couldn't do anything about it, you stole a horse from me. You called me a horse thief? You ran him into a chuck hole and you left him with a broken leg. I had to shoot him. You got nerve. Name your price. I might pay it. You'll pay it. My price is the life of the man who stole that horse. You got a gun. Dig for it. You move first, Hunsaker. I'm giving you an edge. Better take it. No. I want to give you a little time, Hunsaker. If I draw first, then you gotta move without thinking. But I want you to think. I want you to think and decide 
and worry. You're talking big. A little too big. I want to give you time. Like you gave it to a horse with a broken leg. Because you won't draw fast enough, Hunsaker. Not even if you move first. I'm going down to the livery stable to take a nap. At sundown, I'm coming back up the street and I don't want anybody on it. You better shoot me in the back while I'm going out that door, because if you don't, I'm going to kill you, Hunsaker. The flame was in Hunsaker's eyes, too. But it was a man's hate, not pure and white, but diluted with the memory of the way Ben's gun hung, and diluted with just a shadow of fear. Ben went back and slept, like he said. I sat beside him for the best part of an hour. And then I shook him. Mm. Kind of gentle. Sun's hanging pretty low, Ben. Just about time to get up and wash. Why don't you start for home, Dan? I'll catch up to you later. Well, I thought that I'd wait up at the hotel. All right, Dan. See you later. Yeah, man. I'll I'll see you later. So here I am, in the window of the hotel, and yonder he is in the street, him and Kirby Hunsaker, walking towards each other. And the town is so quiet you can hear their steps on the boardwalk. Fingers of the right hand is clawed like hooks, almost touching the gun butts. Don't even seem like the sun is moving anymore. Like even the shadows is glued there on the ground waiting for one of them hands to move. Because when it comes, it'll come fast. dig, Hunsaker. You punk. I'm going to collect for that horse. Dirty metal. <laughs> That's your receipt, Hunsaker. Hey. Ben! Ben! Ben, are you all right, boy? I'm all right. Let's walk. Well, well it's, oh, it's all over now, boy. Let's saddle up and go on hey. home. Hey, wait. It's a blacksmith. Guess our horses are ready. Express rider came in just after you left before. Boys, Watson is riding in. He met him on the trail. You gonna stay and meet him? Me? I got no quarrel with Boaz Watson. Well, looks like you will have. He was mighty keen on meeting up with Hunsaker. Looks like you've taken over Hunsaker's place. You'd better go on alone, Dan. What? What do you mean, Ben? I killed Hunsaker. Now every gunslinger looking for a reputation will try to get it by killing me. From now on, I gotta fight or run. Well, I'll I'll stay with you. I've been holed up in one place too long anyhow. No, Dan. uh, This is where we gotta split. Right now. Thanks for everything. I'll never forget you. Goodbye, Dan. Goodbye, Ben. Goodbye, boy. Goodbye, son. Escape's talented team of writers included Kathleen Height, Morton Fine, David Freakin, E. Jack Newman, and John Meston. It was... Oh, mid-year of 50 that John Dunkel left his position to freelance. He was indeed busy doing that. It was then that John Meston took over his job. John had been head of what we all called censorship, but a more high-powered bit of nomenclature would be continuity acceptance. But anyway, he took over Dunkel's spot, busied himself with 
working on scripts that were submitted and were going to various shows that were on the air at that time, like Suspense and Escape and others. Shortly after he joined the uh, staff, Meston wrote his first script, as far as I was concerned, the first script that, of his that I worked on was Crossing Paris. That was on Escape. If you had been in Paris during the occupation by the Nazis, the filthy Bausch, you would was, as they say, mid-year or a little after mid-year of 1950. John had never thought of himself, I don't think, as a budding writer, but it went well, and Crossing Paris received critical acclaim, and everybody was very taken with it. It was about two or three months later on the same series, Escape, he did a western called Wild Jack Rhett. It was something that John and I were becoming increasingly interested in, this approach to a western, which was not like the others on the air. John, as a matter of fact, said there ought to be a way to do an adult western, meaning that adults could enjoy it, it didn't, without any implication of psychological overtones or anything. When he said adult western, he meant merely that it wasn't a kid western. It was that simple. driver, teamster, and buffalo hunter restlessly searched out friend and enemy along the dusty main street. A small hill rose on the western edge of Red Mesa, plagued with a rash of graves, some marked and cared for, others sinking and forgotten. Man that is born of woman has but a short time to live and is full of misery. He cometh up and is cut down like a flower. He flieth as it were a shadow. While we're praying, a couple of you boys start throwing some dirt on the sheriff. Oh, Lord, with whom do live the spirits of them that be dead, and in whom the souls are dead? Well, Jack Rett was the first of several shows that we experimented with, done in late 1950. We experimented with what was then called exaggerated sound patterns. Uh, they weren't exaggerated. It was merely that we avoided the old radio cliche of never have any dead air. We had lots of dead air, and it seemed to work. Gentlemen, to make this town a decent place for a If our lead walked across a room, we took time to let him walk across the room and didn't keep dialogue going. If somebody was leaving... And crossing the street, we would hear the door close down the steps, cross the sidewalk, and across the street. And it seemed to be very effective. In Wild Jack Rhett, John Daner stars in a role he would emulate a decade later in Have Gun, Will Travel. Three weeks later, Wild Jack Rhett rode into Red Mesa. He was 38 and at the peak of his reputation. He stood well over six feet, better than 200 pounds of plain sinew. Tawny blonde hair grew long in the frontier style, and his features, fair and tinted like a girl's, were boldly aquiline. He was a picturesque man, till one looked at his eyes, which were large and pale blue, and had the disconcerting trick of remaining too steadily on people. There was to be seen in him the suggestion of inhumanity. He sent word to the committee that he'd meet him at the mayor's office that evening. Hey, it's 8 o'clock now. Where is he? He's in town, and that's bad enough. Dear sport, boy, Helen. We took a fair vote on Rhett. <laughs> Here he comes now. My name is Jack Rhett. I have your offer. I'm Peter Wayne, mayor of Red Mesa. Do you accept it? Depends on what you want. Tell me. Rhett, this is a difficult town. Chisholm Trail lies just across the river, and we get most of our money from the riders passing through Texas cattle. Now we want them to have a decent time for their money, but we don't like a lot of gunplay and killing. I've always been accustomed to complete authority, Mayor. I presume to know my job, and I won't have interference. That's agreed, Rhett. By the way, the last sheriff had a rule that riders leave their hardware at his office. He had trouble enforcing it. A poor rule. Let them pack their guns. That gives the wild ones a fair chance at you. I never give a man a fair chance at me. 
Is that all, gentlemen? Bo Helen's saloon was the usual deadfall, with a huge bar along one side of the room and gaming tables toward the rear. Next morning, Bo Helen stood tapping the mahogany of the bar with his fingertips, staring thoughtfully at nothing. Good morning, Bo Helen. It's noon, Samus. Huh? Oh, sure. Uh, draw me a beer, Mike. Uh, where's the new sheriff, Bo Helen? Over there at the corner table. Came in just before you did. Uh huh. Barkeep, bring me a cigar, and a glass of rye. Yeah. Now he's going to clean and reload his six guns, one at a time. I got it, he is. How'd you know? It's an old gunman's trick to impress the citizens. But there's no one here except you and me. Then it's to impress me. Don't hurt. Well, uh, goodbye, Bo Helen, uh, Mike. <clears throat> You've got something to say to me, Bo Helen? Yes, yes, I have. You're smart, Red. I recognize that. But your record for killing is too severe, and my business depends on an open town. Now, the reform element got you, and I'll go along for now. But just remember one thing. I can break you, Red, any time. I was waiting for that, Bo Helen. Well, and I guess we understand each other. Hello? <laughs> oh, any luck, Matt? Just a morning's ride. Uh, Matt, uh, here's Jack Red. Red, this is Mac Traven, a U.S. Deputy Marshal for the district. Glad to know you, Red. You're young. Don't be misled. Red, your job is in town. Mine is everything outside. So I'll either back you up here in Red Mesa or I'll leave you strictly alone. I'll handle Red Mesa. All right. One more thing. I want Todd Mallon. All I know is that some of the finest roles and some of the most classic stories came up on that show. That was Norm MacDonald's show, by the way. Bill Robeson did it for a while. Working with Bill Robeson was always interesting because there was a lunch break. The first two acts would be rehearsed in tremendous detail with extreme synchronization of sound effects and balance and everything. And after lunch, we never got around to the third act of the dress rehearsal. <laughs> and so the last part of the show was always sort of winged. <laughs> Probably the best part. Although Escape would never again attract a sponsor, the tight-knit crew of production people continued to work together. As they perfected exaggerated sound patterns and adult-themed dramas, William Paley requested a series emulating the hard-boiled adventures of Philip Marlowe, but set in the Old West. <laughs> 